Welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University. This podcast seeks to bring together the worlds of academia and professional practice. If you're interested in the latest research and trends in sport and want to hear from experts from around the world, then subscribe now because this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Martin Foster, Applied Sport Management Lead at Loughborough University. Today, we're here with Dr. Dominic Malcolm, Reader in the Sociology of Sport at Loughborough University, and Kerry Glendon, Physiotherapist at Loughborough Sport. We're here to talk about the concussion crisis in sport. We hear Dom discuss what the concussion crisis is and how it's become a global crisis across multiple sports. We discuss the potential short-term effects of concussion and the growing evidence from the NFL that highlights the potential long-term effects. Finally, we tackle some controversial questions, including, are females more susceptible to concussion and should heading be banned in football? But before we do, let's hear a brief introduction from our two guests, starting with Dom. Hi, yeah, I'm a sociologist here at Loughborough University. Uh, I specialise in the study of sport and particularly health and medicine in sports. So for about the last 20 years or so, I've been looking at how athletes experience injury and how the people charged with treating those athletes experience that a role of managing and treating and, and helping athletes back into performance. Very nice, and you've got a book about this as well. So yeah, we'll and so the there. culmination of, of this last twenty years of work really is the publication this year of uh, a book uh, called the "Concussion Crisis in Sport," um, which is a, a short book, but it tries to cover all the different fields that are talking about concussion at the moment. So, medicine, ethics, public health, and sociology, of course, where I'm, I'm based. And we have Kerry. Hi. Yes, um, I'm a physiotherapist. Um, I work primarily in, in rugby and have done for, for a while now. I treat um, concussion um, injuries in terms of recognising them on the pitch and then getting them back um, back on the pitch and helping them through that kind of rehab process. I've um, also started doing a PhD in concussion. Again, uh, my focus really is on that return to play process and how that looks, particularly in a student athlete population and looking if there's anything we can do to improve how we specifically manage a concussed student athlete. You have to manage how their academic work looks as well as their sporting requirements. Okay. Well, as, as often happens in these podcasts, I'm kind of here to facilitate your conversation. We want to hear two experts in sport talking about it in, the, in their specific fields. So to get us started, um, your book's called The Concussion Crisis in Sport. Talk us through it. So is there a, a concussion crisis in sport? Yeah, so... I chose that title initially because lots of other people were talking about a crisis and, and, and it's the kind of title that draws people in and is catchy and, and tells you something about the urgency of this social issue. But as I developed the book, I realised that I'm using it in a slightly different way, in a slightly specialist way. And what I mean by there being a crisis over concussion in sport is that it's just getting bigger and bigger. And what I mean by that is getting bigger and bigger is we're seeing that it, this is a global phenomenon now. So issues that started in North America around uh, American football are now being picked up, uh, particularly in the UK, in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and increasingly across Europe as well and we're seeing it spread across a whole range of different sports so increasingly sports like um, football, uh, soccer uh, are being drawn into the concussion crisis but even sports like cheerleading um, and uh, sports that you wouldn't normally associate with head injuries are beginning to be drawn into this concussion crisis and the reason why fundamentally it's a crisis is because it seems almost impossible to resolve. All of these different factors are feeding into each other and just fueling the problem. Um, and it looks like uh, any resolution to this is a long way away. OK, you, you mentioned in your book there's a um, congressional review um, from this. So what, what happened with that? Did that exacerbate this, this problem? So the big thing in North America that's driven this, I suppose, is issues around the NFL. And the congressional reviews looked into the behaviour of uh, the NFL and inquired into whether or not their um, 
their medical commission and their head injuries uh, uh, committee were sitting on negative research results, whether they were hiding the true dangers from, from the broader public. And there's a very significant book here in the States called League of Denial, which talks about whether the NFL was in denial of this problem for a number of years, hid the problem from players and from the public, because there are huge financial interests um, vested in the NFL. Um, and to have that kind of negative publicity, to have mothers in particular thinking that they can't let their children go and do this sport, would they feared would be the de death of, uh, of the NFL. So Congress stepped in. Uh, Congress has had a number of inquiries uh, focused on the NFL, but also a range of other different aspects of, of uh, head injury in sport. And ultimately, the NFL came to an out-of-court settlement um, with the players of in the region of one billion dollars would be set aside to pay for these things and so you, you simply have to mention one billion dollars and you know that this is a big issue yeah do we do we do we see this as an issue in other sports so so back in the uk have we seen this as an issue where we potentially think things are being hidden or is it not the same kind of level what's what's the opinion on that my feeling is that um in other sports, there's no evidence of things being hidden. Um, there are accusations, particularly around football authorities, for instance. So people have been critical of the FA um, about whether they've been slow to move. But slow to move is different to actually covering things up. So, so, um, so there's a sense that, well, perhaps people could be doing things more urgently. But, um, but e equally, the English FA are probably the football association in the world that is taking the lead on this and has pushed further than anybody else. And, and it's, ironically, them who are being criticised for, for being slow in tackling this. Yeah, so it's, so it's potentially being picked up as a problem and people are now trying to do something about it, but people are complaining that it was a problem a long time ago. That's, yeah, that's that what things we're, we're should have been done uh, more quickly. But across all sports, you yeah. see rule changes... Um, and concussion is the one injury that um, sports rules have particular protocols for, and they're really uh, extensive. Um, and whereas you can treat more or less any injury as you like, I guess, um, with concussion there's strict protocol um, and there's uh, extensive uh, bodies of text within the rule book that say how exactly these things should be um, treated and managed. And obviously, rugby being one of those sports that you know this can potentially happen. Um, how how are things dealt with in rugby at the moment, and and how has it changed over the last five, ten years? Has there been a significant change since since some of these protocols have been brought in? Yeah, so the RFU are pretty clear at, at all levels of play. They recommend a um, a player education system, and at some levels of play, it's mandatory. So players have to complete the online modules in terms of recognising concussion, and healthcare professionals working within rugby have to um, complete have to complete these online education modules and attend courses to show that they're aware of what concussion is and how to recognise it and make sure they're competent in recognising and assessing and treating concussion. So things have come quite a long way from where they were. When when I think back to what I was taught at university, I don't remember concussion being taught as part of the syllabus, whereas now concussion is, is hopefully at the forefront of anyone working within sport that's a, that's a really interesting point to contextualize where we're at we're, we're talking things have changed and so from when you was at university mm -hmm. um and i know listeners you can't see kerry you don't look very old <laughs> so it couldn't have been that long ago that, um, that these things were happening you don't have to disclose that kind of information so <laughs> so don't so don't worry about that but hopefully these things have changed now even with athletes having a better understanding of concussion themselves do you think and you don't have to state any particular times do you think the protocol is always being stuck to or or are people still the age old he's had a bang on the head give him a slap around the face and he'll be okay and carry on because i've got a story about that in a minute i think because concussions in the limelight so much now most people most healthcare professionals are seen to be doing the right thing or st or doing what the protocol says because in, in terms of like the media attention throughout major tournaments the media is almost looking for examples of when it's not done correctly so everyone is sticking to the book 
what about the lower level so obviously the education courses are happening people are learning what they should be doing where do we think that is and I know that's obviously passing the responsibility onto the individual mm -hmm. where do we think rugby's at with that at the lower level do you have any experience yeah. of, of that at I, all from what I've witnessed it's it's very good but again that's only from my own experiences I haven't witnessed any, anything recently where management hasn't been what you would recommend or, or wouldn't be what agreed with the protocols so in my experience it's been pretty good. Well, that'd be that'd be a great cultural shift wouldn't it because you know that age old you know man up and get out there and get on with it would be what you potentially expect but if people are now t taking responsibility for themselves and no um, peer pressure on each other just to get up and play that would be a great place to that, be I mean that would be the hope I, I think um, at different levels of the game you're going to see very different types of experience so one study that I was involved with um, that focused on amateur rugby players in Ireland um, very much revealed a, a really cavalier attitude towards head injuries that actually they'd much rather have a head injury than a muscular skeletal injury because they felt they could get over these head injuries quite quickly it doesn't stop them playing particularly so most athletes what they the way they judge an injury from a niggle is does it stop me playing and very often a head injury doesn't stop you playing or doesn't stop you playing for very long and certainly doesn't stop you playing for the um 10, 14 days of a return to play protocol. Um, most athletes would feel that they're okay with that. The other thing I'd say about at the elite level of sport is that almost any rule is an opportunity for people to try and seek an advantage around that rule. So um, one of the criticisms that has been kind of raised over the last few uh, Six Nations is... Um, there have been question marks about the French use of concussion substitutes where players were coming off and they didn't really look concussed and people were like, this is really, really conservative and cautious. But it's an opportunity to get another player on the field for 10 minutes and, and get a bit of rest. I don't think the concussion rules are particularly being gamed. I don't think there, there's more gaming around those rules than there is any other rule. But the nature of elite sport is... We look for marginal gains. We look for those tiny little advantages that are going to favour the team. And every rule opens up an opportunity for that. So it's a fair point. I'm just going to bring back to what you were talking about before. So just a random story for everybody. So 2000 was the World Cup here 2015? I'm right there, aren't I? So I was working somewhere and we had an international team based at our campus. And I was watching training. I should have been working, but I was watching them train. And a, a tackle happened, innocuous kind of tackle. It was on a 3G pitch, nothing big. Knocked out the star man. Full on, he must have been 10 yards from me, knocked out. The team that it was, I'm not going to mention them, came, slapped him about a bit, threw him back in. And he was 100% sparked, and he was back in. He played the whole tournament. Um, so that's just back in 2015 that at international level, I saw it firsthand that the, this kind of thing was dealt with in the old-fashioned way um so yeah it, it, it potentially behind closed doors may still happen um hopefully that's changed over five years but it's one of those stories where you go you know we we will kind of avert your eyes because we clearly shouldn't have seen what's just happened um so this is an interesting anecdote to add to the add to the mix i, th I think i mean across elite sport there is medical innovation let's call it innovation but there is there i mean these are the areas where you experiment and you try and do different things to get an edge and you see that in the use of performance enhancing substances and whether they're legal or, or, or not you see this across sport that people will try and and bend the rules and with concussions happening in training there's much more opportunity for that i think as kerry says the media spotlight on um on televised events gives us a very different flavor that there is uh, people are going to be held accountable because of that level of scrutiny but what goes on in training for instance is is a, is a different matter and what we see in the in north america there's been lots and lots of studies in north america about how attitude how athletes are responding to these kind of educational programs and and the findings are not very encouraging the findings are that actually athletes are quite resistant to um to change um that they they've, they've been brought up in this culture of sport and and they've learned particular ways to do things and that those are really resistant to change so it's quite a a, a tough battle to to um alter that completely 
I think that's a really interesting thing. Do, do you find that with physio? Our players, so we saw in the World Cup final, um, Sinclair was very reluctant to come off. I know he didn't know what day it was, and we could all see that actually this is the right thing to do. But do you find that on the rugby field that, that players are resistant? And is it like, oh, come on, he's okay and all that? Or are people more like, no, actually... We need to be okay. We need to be careful with this. I think it very much depends on the individual. Some athletes are more likely to report concussion symptoms than others. Um, so, I think you have to know your players. It's really important that you know what your players are like during training, but also how they might be different during a match because changes in mood or changes in the way that they're behaving on the pitch may be your only subtle signs that they've had a concussive episode at the end of the day you can only you can only at the moment diagnose a concussion by what the person's telling you so unless you have any visible signs of like ataxia which is like being unbalanced or unsteady on your feet or losing consciousness or or kind of or having any visible kind of kind of tonic posturing where someone that's where someone lies on the floor with their arm outstretched in front of them. In the absence of those visible or, or like visual signs of symptoms of symptoms of concussion, you really are at the moment reliant upon what the person's telling you. And so, with that, what what is the? Can you you know to educate people out there? What is the concussion protocol um, for when somebody's? you know been knocked out or? so the RFU are very clear on their statement in terms of if in doubt sit them out so if there's any, if there's any doubt that they might have suffered a concussive episode you sit them out and get them reviewed by a medical professional to see if they if they are concussed or not and is that the same in the NFL does anybody do you guys know yeah. with the NFL uh, so one of the things that we've seen I mean that that's <laughs> Um, that's basically sport wide. The kind of if in doubt, sit them out. Or the, there, and there are different phrases about recognise, remove, r- return, and and so on. Um, but because we know so little about the brain, and because we know so little about head injury, um, there. The only really safe way to deal with these things is if uh, if there are any concerns, take the most cautious line that you possibly can and I think one of the interesting things about concussion and to hear Kerry talk about the difficulties that she has on the pitch um, reading different signs of loss of consciousness is is possibly the easiest one to see because it is is visible to everybody but amnesia or lack of balance or dizziness or effect to the uh, vision and things like this or hearing they're really difficult symptoms to pick up and you are reliant on the individual reporting to them. And the opposite is, um, you gave the um, Sinclair example, that there's five million people sitting on their sofas in England going, he's clearly concussed, you've got to take him off. So on the one hand, we've got the medical experience, which is, this is a really difficult thing to diagnose. And on the other hand, you've got millions of people watching television and saying this is really easy to diagnose i can see it from over here so that's the kind of that's the kind of contradiction that really fuels this crisis and what you have in the nfl i know they've moved more towards um neutral concussion spotters so people sat in the stands who are informing the medical teams if they see something from there that that needs to be addressed and i mean generally i'm a big big advocate of more and more um neutral medical support across sport so Mm -hmm. across the whole of sport the more you have medical staff tied to the coaching staff the more difficult it is for the medical staff to perform the irony here is that concussion is probably the one injury where it really pays to have somebody who knows the athlete that's what you're looking at tiny tiny things that you would only pick up if you really knew the individual. Yeah, so you're in a catch-22 there, really, aren't you, with with, with, with that? Yeah. Whether it should be that neutral yeah. or that somebody who understands them. Um, somewhere in between the balance may lie of that discussion of a, a neutral and yeah. a, you know somebody who knows them. So they've implemented that in rugby this year where they have an independent doctor who will do a HIA or a head injury assessment alongside the team doctor. And then it's a discussion between the impartial doctor the team doctor and the athlete to to kind of come to that conclusion um, and I think 
I think that's definitely a better way to go. So they'll have they'll have someone up in the stands. One, so you'll you'll have your own team member up in the stands watching at video footage at all angles to try and identify anyone that might have had a collision or might have had an impact to the head that might require a HIA. Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, we're talking a lot about concussion, but what are the what are the problems with concussion, both short term, but I think a lot of this has come from the long-term potential issues of concussion. What evidence do we have for that? Well, <laughs> we no one really... I'd- I don't think anyone would really be able to say this is the long-term implication of suffering a concussion. I think every concussion is so so individual to the, to the person. So the same person could have the same amount of head impact on two occasions and each time that concussion be very different. Same as the two different people could have the same impact and those two people have very different concussion Mm. symptoms so there's so many variables that go into a concussion in terms of looking at long term we know there's a trend emerging i think well there's nothing concrete yeah so uh, my reading of the data from the nfl is that it's really compelling so the boston university studied um they've got a brain bank uh, of um, uh, brains donated by former NFL players, and they've uh, the figure that's often quoted: 110 out of 111 brains studied as former NFL players showed signs of CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And the belief is that that CTE is linked to dementia-type symptoms. Um, but more complicated perhaps than that also um, violence and aggression and and behavioural problems that are linked to that Um, and that figure 110 out of 111 is enormous but the gaps in our knowledge here are one we don't know what it is that's causing this pattern in the brain other than exposure to to American Mm -hmm. football it would appear and we don't know what the link is between that pattern in the brain and dementia and other behavioural symptoms. So the, the, we don't really understand what that link is. Um, but I personally find that very compelling. I was talking to a guy, um, former NFL player, recently, and he showed me the flip side of this. And he said, one of the things that really disturbs me about this is that since I've retired, since I've stopped playing, everybody comes up to me and says, are you all right, mate? <laughs> because it's almost like now it's everybody thinks happen. it's going to happen yeah. you've got this terrible disease and it's inevitable for you yeah and he's kind of fighting back from that and and is trying to put the other side of it not every player um who played in the nfl is gonna have dementia and these figures would appear to suggest otherwise um and i think we do need to move away from this idea that everybody who takes part in elite sport is gonna get this um CTE or dementia type symptoms later on and that's what we're seeing with football and the concerns around heading in football at the moment uh, linked around Jeff Astle who clearly did have dementia clearly did head the ball frequently and that was central to his playing career um, and the recent study out of Glasgow that showed that former professional footballers had higher rates of dementia than other than the normal public is, is the big scary elephant in the room I suppose here but could that also be linked to many other things as discussed before? So could it be lifestyle of a professional athlete or, or, or many other things? It's not necessarily linked to concussion as yet. I think that's what... Yeah, and many things have changed since then. So mm. the weight of the football is very different now. I, I would imagine concussion is dealt with very differently now to what it was when the ex-NFL players were playing. So hopefully the trend will start to bend the other way mm. and that we'll see people aren't as affected as what some of the, the reports would have first alluded to. I know, I know you talk to like more first team managers nowadays in, in football and youngsters coming through conversations with mo- multiple people is they can't head the ball anymore because I think people have started to be so scared of, mm. of youngsters heading the ball and obviously people play football in a different style now but actually heading the ball well as a centre half could actually be a feature that needs to come back into the game but obviously not if if this is a well we don't know um and there are there are also other things in that population study which is very interesting that so former professional footballers tended to live longer than the general population so so it's not all bad 
And in some ways, it shouldn't surprise us that former professional athletes get certain types of injuries because it is a really, really dangerous thing to do for your health to be a professional athlete. I saw a study a few years ago that said being a, a professional footballer was 500 times more dangerous than the next most dangerous profession in the UK. <laughs> I mean, injuries are routine and we, we just accept them because it's sport and maybe that's OK, but let's not hold our hands up in shock when we find out that um yeah former athletes suffer because of uh because of the exertions they've put themselves through and i think that takes us back to a little bit what we spoke about at the start is that we are now understanding what caused it or potentially could be causing problems so if we can remove some of those problems then we may help in the future you know that's yeah i mean certainly we're, we're looking at um what is it that we can take out of sport to minimise these these dangers and that's where the concussion protocols come in that we've got now because I mean ultimately they are about precaution and, 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 and faith that actually resting players and taking them out of sport is, is the right thing to do there's not a huge amount of evidence for it but you'd be stupid if you didn't go along with it because for most people what are what's to be gained by playing through a particular game when you've had a head injury? Not very much I would suggest um, but the fundamental problem is that our understanding of the brain is so limited that we just we just don't know. So what we're doing is to be as safe as, as possible. And there's clearly, across the population, there's going to be some people who think we should be really, really safe and avoid all contact, if you like, or avoid all heading for all players. And there are other people who are saying, well, sport is a good thing. Uh, people like sport. We... We generally let people do what they like in this country unless they're injuring other people or they're injuring themselves in a way that they don't understand. But, you know, people can still smoke tobacco. Yeah. Uh, and, and It's pretty it's personal choice, isn't it? Yeah. You know, if we know the risks and we communicate that out to people, we minimise the risk as much as possible, but yeah. then it should be left with the individual. That would be my personal opinion. But I suppose it's the wider side of if there's more medical problems coming and occurring from certain th situations the cost and the burden on the NHS as an example is is another thing that could be potentially considered from a wider societal um, piece yeah and that's um, that's very much the fear around dementia is yeah. that this is something which is getting bigger and bigger it's getting bigger because populations are getting older uh, and it's in many ways dementia is is a cause or no is the outcome of us solving a lot of other medical conditions um but there is this big fear that um that's particularly costly to deal with dementia um that it's particularly traumatic um because we only really hear the stories of the family who are looking after the dementia patient by their very nature the dementia patient can't really tell us how they feel mm. um so there are big concerns about that and i think that's what is in many ways sensibly driving the concussion protocols um, and I th but I think there's also we do need to recognise that actually you know people are normally allowed to do things that they want to do if because they get enjoyment from that, it's central to their lives um, and it's an important sense of meaning for them so we need to resist cutting uh, or throwing the baby out with the bathwater I suppose no fair we're going we're gonna to start coming to a close so I've got a few questions that I want to try and get in I think from from I think you're from your book Dom um, I think you mentioned something about girls and whether girls are actually at more risk or not and what evidence there is either, either side of that coin yeah controversial question there <laughs> but well I, so I go back to what Kerry was saying about the actual diagnosis um, of concussion you rely on the individual a lot so it's not a hard and exact science <laughs> there are certain things you can definitely look for there's certain things you rely on others studies coming out of the states in particular are showing that girls are reporting higher rates of concussion now that might just be a different awareness that might just be a different attitude to injury what concerns me about this is that if you look through the history of sport the medical community have consistently said girls shouldn't do this because they're not as strong as men and this will damage them. And that's my real fear about this data around girls and concussion. It could create that scarcity and, and, and cause a problem for participation. Is that, is that what you... you yeah, it's picking up on a fear, a cultural fear, that girls are not as suitable for, suited for sport as boys are. And that's not 
in my mind or my reading medically justified yeah. but is um but one of the the consequences of this concussion crisis might be that you get greater attention focused on girls playing football girls playing rugby and we mm. go back to the dark ages the dark ages yeah it's, it's interesting because the, the, the phrase that the word that came up when you said that to me was females reported it more yeah now if i had my four-year-old boy and, and six-year-old girl in this room i know who's going to tell me stuff the most and it's the little girl <laughs> so you know that's no scientific study yeah. there but maybe it's just the reporting that is more prevalent in the female side that could just be the only issue and that's consistently found with baseline testing. So at the beginning of the season, you would baseline test all of your players to get a number what's normal for them. And it, at baseline testing, females do report more baseline symptoms than what than what males would do. So it's it's consistent. It's a consistent finding in most mm. research that girls are higher responders. They're more likely to to report stuff. So there you go, solved it. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of, couple of other questions then, just, just to kind of wrap up. Should we ban heading in football? So my argument to that would be um, we shouldn't extrapolate from the findings of professional players to the game as a whole. So the idea that... Um, so even if we knew that heading caused dementia amongst former professional players, that doesn't create a compelling argument to stop kids heading the football at a lower level. We know that professional sport is a dangerous thing and um, we also know that um, at a more grassroots level there are injuries injuries are common but, but the, the risks are lower. So I don't think the com- case is comp- particularly compelling um, I think there are other issues around the use of heads in sport I, I mean I, I don't want kids to be pushed into things they're not happy doing um, and I don't know that there's a great reason why you want kids to head the ball quite a lot and you know if I was a yes, coach fair. I'd be saying well let's um, keep the ball on Get the on ground the floor and play. yeah yeah play yeah. because in many ways that's more inclusive for the team and, and, and more enjoyable for many so um I don't think the science is there, basically, to okay. say ban heading. Fair enough. Kerry, what about tackling in rugby? Well, tackling in rugby is part and parcel of the game. So um, I think there's been quite a few rule changes to try and improve the incidence of concussion in the tackle. And I think more work along that lines will hopefully in the future continue to reduce those concussion risks. And, and have the change in the rules resulted in less concussions or do we not know because people are now reporting them more so there's a bit of a conflict there well exactly I, I mean like if you if you look at the amount of research that's that's been published over the past 10 like 10 years in concussion it's really over the past few years where you've seen a massive spike in the number of articles published and when you look back at the concussion data you can you'll see over the past five ten years the the increase in concussion reporting the reported concussions has also spiked and is that because of improved awareness and education that a lot of the work by the RFU is kind of improved someone's ability to recognize and report it has that caused more concussions to be record to be reported I very much doubt it's caused more concussions to occur so it's um it's a chicken and egg situation really it would be really hard to say which ones cause more concussions but just to be clear we're definitely saying tackling is to stay in rugby yeah I don't <laughs> think you could play rugby it wouldn't th- it wouldn't look like rugby it'd be it'd be a different Touch game rugby. And, yeah exactly it'd be a different game I think there's there's a different issue around um tackling in PE lessons in schools yeah okay. so, so so there's Fair a different point. issue around the consent of the individual you know um I think every individual has to we wouldn't be happy with kids boxing in school for instance yeah and I think and tackling in rugby in schools is the the next most dangerous thing you can't just get rid of the next most dangerous thing because in the end you get rid of everything so yeah. that's not a good argument but there is a question mark about. I think. I think the the question mark comes if if, if students are coming and learning and, and growing at the same level and developing and, and and there's a there's a time to introduce tackling. Yeah. However, so this is personal experience from years ago. My school was massively football, and we had rugby lessons. And probably I don't know year eight, year nine, first time I'd ever played rugby. <laughs> In, in my P group was the three counties captain. So it was captain Nottinghamshire, Lincolnshire and Derbyshire. And I'm, you know, Mr. Billy Footballer. And so 
the first thing when I try and grab the ball he stamped on my hand and I was offside so apparently that was allowed and I was like <laughs> uh, okay no idea what's going on and I thought okay I'm just going to have a run at him he picked me up and dump tackled me so after that I didn't want to play rugby yeah. because of that difference between the two of us and mm-hmm. I think that's the yeah. thing in schools that people have to need to be careful with yeah and it also comes back to Dom's point earlier about heading in football if you're appropriately coaching heading in football at the appropriate volume and intensity mm. to meet to match the ability of the person in front of you then it's going to be much safer than getting someone who's never headed the ball to head a 60 balls in a row because they need to learn how to do it it's it's building it in gradually like you said and and making sure that the amount that the teaching is of good quality and it's appropriate for the person that's in front of you I think that's exactly it. It's, it's being sensible and appropriate. I think for, for me, I, I would totally agree with. Final final question. Um, so dangerous sports like NFL or, or in fact, kind of the money that's going out of NFL because of crisis like this. Do you think that they'll be able to continue long term if, if these issues are, you know, continue to be a problem? I think that the financial interests in some of these big sports are so significant that they are likely to continue. I think the other thing I'd say is that actually the pos- there's a, a ready supply of people who want to take part in these sports. And we focus on the NFL or we focus on rugby, but actually, interestingly, it's, it's the case of boxing because what we're now saying about the NFL and rugby and football has been known about boxing for years and years and years. And the British Medical Association and many other medical associations suggest that that should be banned. And it still hasn't been banned. So it, that's quite yeah. a cautious note to make you think, well, actually, well, should the NFL go? Um, it changes people's lives, uh, the players who, who take part in, in, in the NFL. Um, and not always in good ways, but for some people in incredible ways. It has incredible meaning for people as well. It's popular for a reason. Um, and so it's not likely to just disappear. The interesting thing about sport is that it, it's always the thing in our society that is more dangerous than most other things. We take part in sport because we can tackle each other, we can run into each other in a way that we can't do in everyday life. And that's the joy of sport, that's the appeal of sport. And sports do change over time and they become less violent over time, but they will always be one of the most violent and physical things in our society. I, th- I think that's a great point to finish on. Thank, thank you very much for coming in and, and kind of chatting to us. I think the insight you've given us into what concussion is, on, you know, both medically and the, the sociological side of things, um, gives a great insight to everyone. I think potentially the take-home message being that we need to think about con- concussion. We need to think and learn more about what's happening with concussion and whether it's a problem. We need to be pragmatic in educating everybody around it, but. If people want to play sport, let's play sport. Let's make it as safe as possible, um, but let's see what the future holds for for concussion. So thank you guys for for coming in, um, and I'm sure I'll speak to you again in the future. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks for listening to the Loughborough Sportcast. If you want to get in touch and let us know any subject areas or experts that you'd be keen to listen to, then contact me, Martin Foster, on m.foster at alborough.ac.uk or tweet me at martinfoster82. Bye for now. We'll see you next time.